What's up, everybody? Another new edition of Celtics Beat. Great to have you here with us. It is January 14th. I know I mentioned that, but I'm saying it again because it's my mom's birthday. So even though I know she's not out there <laughs> listening, happy birthday, mom. Happy Way birthday. to be. I'll, I'll text you later on. Happy We're going to get into a whole lot of Celtics stuff. We got Mark Murphy of the Herald, good friend of the program. Of course, Evan Valenti. I'm back here with you. Missed last week's show. Evan, kind enough to uh, take the reins on that one with Chris Grenham. So that was, an, a, very, that was a very emotional show, Coffin. If you had, I could have yeah, believed. I, 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 all over Twitter, people were talking about how emotional it was. How, out of all the shows you could have missed, like that's the one <laughs> I feel like you should have been a part of. You know, like that was such a. What I mean, coming right off that Knicks loss. I mean, it was right after the loss. It was like it was like oh. I was on fire that night. I was texting you all night. Yeah, uh, and I was like, I was like, I gotta get like I spent oh. so much time trying to get my thoughts together after the game oh. and writing it down because I'm like, I need to get the emotion that's in here on the screen. So when I go at it tomorrow morning, I still have that pent up yeah. energy. And I just I couldn't. I was so mad, upset, angry, emotional, all that stuff all wrapped up in one. Well, you just described the players after that game. They were <laughs> yeah. in the same state of mind. Although it's so. kind of too bad that you waited until the next morning. I feel like that was – that was if ever there were a good time for this show to have, like, a live post-game Periscope, or I don't even think Periscope <laughs> exists, but a live Twitter, you know, thing in the same way that, you know, people can check out our, our partners over at the Garden Report right after a game, that would have been a good situation for you. Just, boot, like, turn on the camera, turn on the mic, and let's go. Yeah, I should have I should have texted Xanis to be like, have me on your show right now because I'm about to tear everybody a new one. I, <laughs> I, got things, I, was, I got things to say. I was so I was so and the worst part was you could just see it coming. Like mm. as soon as the third quarter started, it didn't get up to a great start. It's like, oh my goodness, are they gonna blow this game to the Knicks? They were up 25 in this game. And then sure yeah. enough, by the start of the uh. fourth quarter, it was what a, a two-point game uh, within after the first two minutes of the fourth quarter, it was like yeah. Like, yeah. I, this is this is impossible that this season is happening and again we had just spent so much time the week prior talking about how the minnesota loss has to be the, oh, most loss of the season and then a week later they just topped it and then luckily and to try and make it full circle here boys we've gotten back on track here the celtics have started well, that, but, but, that, but that's the thing that's the thing you know they they lose to the knicks obviously in in, in the fashion that they did and and it was just it was terrible and it's uh you know bobby valentine once famously said it's like we're you know if, if this isn't rock bottom we're finding new ends of the earth or whatever that <laughs> quote was they go out they blow out the knicks and then they take the home and home from uh from, from the pacers first Indeed. the overtime squeaker and then they blow them out in indiana my guy demonta sabonis and and you know here here we are, three straight wins, boys, for the first time since November. They're back to 500. They're back in the play-in tournament in terms of where the standings are right now. Every, everything's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Every day, we're good. We're good. Trade deadline, all of a sudden, all the articles are, screw sellers. Celtics are going to, they're going to be adding at this point, whether <laughs> it will be fringe moves or the big moves, Mark. Now we're back on track. Now we're getting ready to gas up the duck boats. Yeah. And they're in 10th place in the eastern conference so two yeah. losses and they're back to yeah. where we were but you know it's it's a start and i thought that the game against indiana the second game just the jays both going over 30 it just mm -hmm. offensively it's the best they've looked and i think uh I don't know. They're they're figuring out. They're trying to figure out different ways to play them off each other, and I think that's huge. Uh, the you know Tatum has acknowledged that. He said, you know, we've got to, we can't be taking turns. We've got to be in a flow. And I think, you know, the the indie game that was a pretty good example of what they can do. So like you said, they both go for 30 plus. It was 67 combined points, They're both averaging well over 20 They're Look, they're, they're great when they are on the floor together, despite what people may say or think. And, you know, I, I can't even fathom how tired these guys must be of, of being asked if they can coexist and if they support one another, like you're never, regardless of how they may really feel. And I, I actually do believe that what they're saying is true, but let's just say that you don't. Let's say that you believe that that they're just saying the right things and and they don't really necessarily want to play with each other long term. Who out there believes like I'm going to be the guy to get the quote? They're get they're not going to walk into the trap. They're not going to no. say it. They will never say it so long as they are together. They just won't. They won't. It's not going to happen. They're both too smart to do it. 
Right. You might get little like you know, little sort of inferences or whatever. But like if you're looking for that big banner quote, you got to go over to, you know, Marcus Smart or you got to go to Captain Accountability, Ime Udoka right. or, you know, <laughs> like you're, you're not going to get it, obviously, from Tatum and Brown. And right. then you just you have the little things, right, Mark? You have like the the little the the, the post game Twitter spat with with Tatum and, and Kendra oh, Perkins uh, and our guy, Nick yeah. Gelso getting involved and, you know, other people stoking yeah. the flames. And I just, right. I don't know. I, I, I have so many different thoughts on that, that, you know, we won't explore all of them, but you know, uh, among them, it's just like Nick had suggested, well, what's a superstar or an all-star out there doing searching his name, you know, 30 minutes after a game and responding to, you know, perk because he didn't tag him on right. Twitter. First off, right. I, I I would be inclined to believe, I would like to believe Jason Tatum is not sitting there on his phone after a loss or after a game of any kind, unless he maybe goes for 60 or something, and actually searching Twitter for his name to see what pops up. I think what's far more likely and realistic is, you know, somebody saw it and texted it yeah. to him or said it yeah. to him, and like, hey, look what perk a Celtics alum is saying I about would... you. And then, and then he reacted. He yeah. shouldn't have reacted. It, Jason right. Tatum should not right. have reacted to that. One, it wasn't right. that bad a, a tweet. He just pointed out that he didn't shoot particularly well. Well, well right. Brown right. did. It, it right. wasn't right. like calling him out in, in the way that Tatum took it. But also, and Perk is right about this, whether Tatum or anybody else across the league, players today are kind of soft. They are kind of soft and, and mm -hmm. feeling like they need to react to every little thing and negative criticism. But oh, I think we also need yeah. to remember these guys are young. They're young. Right. He's a guy right. in his early 20s. Sure. But just as an example of a guy who has, you know, people tread on his nerves on social media all the time, Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the guy, the guy has such a thin skin and he is a guy who Tatum looks up to and I'm sure he also looks at his activity on social media but <laughs> well that's a mistake uh, <laughs> but, don't follow but, Durant on social media no, don't follow no, ISO like Kobe no, don't no, don't don't no but I I think I think that Perk at this point does occupy a little real estate up in Tatum's brain I think it's you know, he reacted to it. He reacted the last time. Perk took credit for it the last time. I don't know. <laughs> has he taken has he taken credit for it again? Or? Not that I've seen this time around. Okay. All right. But but I think that going back to the New York game, since the conversations after that game are what this team seems to be all about at the moment, including the one between Tatum and Brown, they are really trying to figure it out. And I think the second Indiana game showed how they're trying to play a little differently, trying to play a little more off the ball in situations. You may be mixing up coverages finally. You know, I mean, you've got to break the ISO stuff, mm -hmm. but he's giving them a mix. It's ISO, pick and roll. You know, it, it's... Uh, and I think if they can find the key to that, you know, they could, they're playing a really good team tonight. So they, it could be back to ground zero, but it's, uh, I just found it really interesting what I saw. The other day. So you mentioned the good team tonight, obviously they're in Philadelphia. Sixers are no pushover as we know, but uh, I, I want to read this. this. is a perfect segue to something that our guy, Brian Robb, part of the CLNS media network as well with his podcast, the winning plays pog, but uh, also uh, you know, not unlike yourself, a beat writer for the team, covers the team for Mass Live, something that he wrote about. I think this went up last night. Life gets easier uh, from from there after uh, Friday night in Philadelphia and then a matchup with the East leading Bulls on Saturday at the Garden. Life gets easier for January. Boston's next eight opponents come against no top 10 NBA squads with the toughest matchup being a 23 and 19 Hornets team at the Garden. In fact, the Celtics have the seventh easiest schedule in the NBA over their last 40 games of the year. So salvaging a suddenly uh, uh, salvaging the season suddenly doesn't seem so far fetched uh, from a big picture standpoint. The metrics for the Boston roster is somewhat promising, despite them being underachieving from a record standpoint. They rank fifth in the NBA in defensive efficiency, 
allowing 104 points per 100 possessions despite the disastrous start to the year at that end of the floor. They have a plus 1.7 net rating on the year, which is 12th in the NBA. I'll just add as well, it's ninth on the Dunks and Threes website right there with Chicago, and that's a website that uh, is is even better in the aggregated data because it takes strength of schedule into account. Just a point behind the likes of the Nets and Sixers. Boston's fourth quarter woes have cost them countless games, 3-11 and in games decided by five points or fewer. They've actually been competitive in almost every game this year despite the flawed roster. And list, you know, the stats and everything goes on from there from right. B-Rob. So I, I, I read all that just to say this. Is it possible, Mark? Is it possible? And this is like the green teamer, green rim glasses, you know, <laughs> looking for what... Are, how much of this has just been bad luck? Like their net rating is better than it was last year. The team is worse, you know, but, but the net rating is better. The, you know, we, we just haven't, we haven't seen it click the way we expected to see it click. How much of what we are seeing the first half of the season is bad luck? No, it's not bad luck. You don't blow 25 point leads with bad luck. You you (laughs) blow those leads with like, lack of toughness i mean they've been a very mentally fragile team and that's what they're working on now i think uh you know they the bulls they were ahead they led the bulls by 19 points earlier this year and lost you know it's that's what they're trying to do now is you know again against indy they i think Indy's biggest run was an 8-0 run in the second quarter, and they but they cut it down to I forget it. Was, they cut it tight, and the Celtics for the first time really just immediately hit back with a 14-4 run. So, you know they're regrouping better. Yeah, that, if you listen to Scal in that broadcast, he was he was getting nervous uh, consistently. I'd say throughout the, the broadcast and every every little mini. Indiana run, you know, Scout would be like, oh, they got to, they got to get a stop here and a score in the next, you know, uh, the next possession. They got to find a way to stop this run because you understand we've watched this for a couple of months now. Boston finds a way to just lose focus and, uh, and, and not execute. It's just, it turns into a toilet bowl offense and that affects them on the defensive. And the one thing I'll say about the Indiana game that I liked a lot was how much Boston and especially Jalen Brown pushed the ball in transition. And, you know, I know Kaufman, you, me, and Lamb have been going crazy about this. Boston, for some reason, like, doesn't run. And it doesn't make any sense because they have a lot of young guys, a lot of young legs that can take advantage of, yeah. of, of, of getting up and down the floor. And it's not like their young guys are, you know, their young guys are wing guys, the guys that can handle the basketball. Mm. So it's not mm-hmm. like their young guys, like some center who can't, can't, you know, start a fast break by himself. It's Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. Those guys can yeah. run. Yeah. So when, right. you know, and in Jalen, I think last year, now I could be slightly off about this, but I've always said that Jalen, once he finally realizes his potential and he tightens up his dribble a little bit, it's going to be an absolute nightmare in transition because of the way his body is built. He's very athletic, very strong, very strong mm-hmm. upper body. He can shield guys. And so now that he's been able to tie up his dribble a little bit, I think he was top three in transition points last year. If he's not top three, he's close to it. I know he was up there throughout most of the season. But that's something where where you, if you can find a way, if your offense is stalling, and Boston's offense, as we've seen all year, stalls. Their spacing is terrible sometimes. And he may hopefully tinkers with lineups to get it to be less of a problem. But if your offense is stalling, Mark, isn't it a good idea to try and get some easy baskets by yeah. getting a rebound, getting the outlet pass, yeah. pushing and trying to get layups, yeah. or at least go to the free throw line? I mean, that's, that's, you go, you look at that, and I'm not trying to say that the season's turning around here, Mark, but since we've kind of used that last Indiana game as a microcosm to say, here's what's possible. Here's what's possible. Boston using Jalen and Jason as guys using actions off each other to create offense, and then also using transition to get yourself easy buckets to stop runs, because as we've talked about, defensively, Boston very good so far this season. They have lapses, everybody does. But for the most part, they're good on off, they're good on defense. And if they can get out and run and steal 12 points a game that way, you won't blow 25 point leads to the New York Knicks. <laughs> right, right. And the other element of that transition game that they should be taking advantage of a lot more, they've got a monster rebounder at the five who's a great passer. Why aren't we getting more outlet passes? You know, that kind of thing. You know, that that just 
that just adds to the transition offense. But I, you know, defensively it is going to be the key. It, that's going to trigger their offense, and that's where they should be. Like I mentioned, the defense is sitting top five defensive efficiency anyway in the NBA. The offense is still in that lower third. It's 22nd, 23rd, 24th, wherever it exactly sits right now. Now, this is, and, and you know, you mentioned my buddy Lamb and Evan. This is something we've been talking about going back to the start of the year. I, I never thought Boston, we, we all knew going into the year, especially based on the offseason moves, the Celtics had the potential to have an elite defense this year. And so sure. far, sure. for the most part, so good. You know, cumulative overall stats, that's yeah. where they're at. They're, they're defending at a very high level. The offense has been far worse than what I expected, though, Mark. I thought they'd be middle of the pack, you know, 15th. Not, you know, it, it like maybe scratch the top 10, get to like right. 11, 12, you yeah. know, certainly not elite, but middle of the pack. I did not see them as a, you know, lower third, bottom six or seven offense. So how much of that uh, are you based on, you know, what we're just hearing from Evan, obviously, and what you were talking yeah. about, how much of that are, are you expecting to, you know, water find its level, or do you feel like they generally are what we've seen this year? I think they're, I think they're really at the start of the season. It's almost like he just gave unlimited ISO opportunities to his best scorers and tried to get by that way. Tried to get by with motion. You know, you remember what he said uh, probably about a week and a half ago about how am I going to have to start calling plays? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah ideally, have, yeah. coach. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. You have to start calling plays and uh, pick and roll. It's and just the right. Dennis Schroeder roll the ball out and go have fun, uh, have a good time. I, I, you know, he's he's probably the most likely to be gone by trade deadline. He should be. I mean, in you know, a little bit. Gonna... I, have a, I have a take on that in a little bit. <laughs> okay, but um, yeah, offensively, they're just they're just figuring it out. It's. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot different than what you've seen. And they've obviously um, they've, they've lost a lot of man games too to injuries to COVID. Right. You know, they've right. we've been we've been talking about this for years. This is not a this year yeah. problem. We've been talking about this for years, basically right. since you know. I, I I keep bringing I do this on on Twitter from time to time just for my own amusement. But you can there are just so many things like bad luck things. We were talking about bad luck. Yeah. There's so right. many bad right. luck things that you can just like you can trace back to like the moment. Danny Ainge traded Isaiah Thomas, you know, it was, oh, it, and, and, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, oh, it shouldn't have traded it. And, and uh, you know, th this was the guy to build around. Like we know what, what unfortunately, tragically, you know, in, in, in NBA scope has, has happened to Isaiah Thomas's right. career with the injury right. and him struggling to, you know, right. find a fit and playing for so many teams right. since, right. but dealing away uh, again, just sort of in this, like this mythical sense, dealing away, you know, your heart and soul, like a guy that truly bleeds green and, and is just right. the, the ultimate ambassador right. for your organization right. for this right. mercenary. Who's just one of the worst people <laughs> ever the way that we always talk yeah. about Kyrie Irving, yeah. like everything has gone to hell in a handbasket True. since then. And in, and, in, in every way, especially yeah. injuries. Gordon Hayward's ankle. I yeah. Mean, five minutes in. Yeah. 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 First night, first night. And, uh, and it just hasn't stopped, yeah. it has, you know, yeah. from, yeah. from the injuries to COVID, it has not stopped. And so but, you know, we keep talking about wanting to see some continuity from, yeah. from you sure. know, living in the moment, this group. And I don't know, I, I just, like, even well, right now, but, like they're playing better, but we're not seeing it. Marcus Smart's well, been out. He could play tonight, but we're still not seeing right. continuity. Right. But with all the, with all the, you know, bad luck and so forth, what it did is it cleared the way for the Jays? Yeah, you know, I mean, Hayward left because he could see what was about what was happening. He didn't want to just be left standing in the corner. He wanted the ball in his hands, so he mm. was gone. Uh, Al leaving was another matter, but these guys, you know, uh, Tatum since his rookie year has just got prime opportunity to get better and. I think if, you know, I think what you have to hang your hat on is those two guys together going forward. It's been a longer growth process than anybody, Ainge included, imagined. But I think this, you know, you're going to see the greatest growth from now on. So 
perfect. I'm glad you said that. And and people are talking about it constantly. Like Jalen Rose was harping about it on ESPN the other day, as he should have been, by the way. So maybe harping isn't the right way to put it, but really hammering the point home for the people. When you have two stars, like NBA or uh, Evan was just talking about the upcoming trade deadline, which is next month. And, you know, the constant should the Celtics get rid of one of the Jays? And of course, if they are naturally, yeah. it's, it becomes Jalen Brown because nobody wants to trade Jason Tatum. So really yeah. the question is not, do you split up the Jays? It's do you trade Jalen Brown? That's what everybody's asking. Right. And people bring up Bradley Beal and people bring up Damian Lillard. And, you know, even like Michael Pina, you know, put an article out uh, about a, a Hawks related deal that didn't bring oh, back. Yeah, that was star, actually a good you know? looking deal, but. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if you yeah. have to trade a star, but you're not getting a yeah. star back, which right. is really right. where I'm going with this, Mark. If you have two young, like, have we forgotten as Celtics fans who have been begging for years to be in this situation where you have two young stars under contract for a long time? Have, have we forgotten how difficult it is in the NBA to find young stars and build through the draft and, and right. do that? And I realize all, all, all the different ways that, that they haven't done a good job building a roster yeah. around them, and that still yeah. needs to continue, but that's the key. Around yeah. them, you don't move Tatum or Brown. I'm not saying they're untouchable. You got to listen. But in an ideal world, you don't move these guys. Yeah. I mean, you have the potential – to bring in a significant number three to them, you don't need, you know, you don't need a top level scorer. You don't, you don't, it, it's, you need a guy who can, you know, is shooting big. A, I could see Chris Paul being huge on this team. There's no way he's leaving Phoenix though, but like, no, yeah, having, no, having a no, point but that type, point. but sure. That type of guy, yeah. how many, the, how many yeah. of those guys are walking around play though? the point? Yeah. There's, there's, not a lot of, many. there's not a lot of those like true point guards walking around. I mean, you yeah. know, the, the pipe dream and not really a pipe dream, but like the, the original Lonzo idea, I was yeah, right. very attracted to because you just, uh -huh. you, and I know Chicago's added a lot of things, but like Lonzo, is infectious with the way he plays mm -hmm. basketball. Mm -hmm. And like, you can just see that that team clicks. I mean, DeRozan's been unbelievable. Don't get me wrong. Zach Levine's a very right. good player. I mean, it's been, but like Lonzo does do something to a team just by being yeah. there. And yeah. it's just not a lot of those guys walking around anymore. Oh. But this oh, whole, have, but, yeah. This whole trade no, Jalen Brown or Jason Tatum thing, like look at her on the league. There's a lot of young talent right now in this league. Like I, I know Adam's talking about how there's, you know, it's hard to find young talent. Well, the past couple of years, this young talent uh, uh, emergence, you know, John Moran obviously leading the train right now. Evan Mobley this year has been unbelievable, but there are other guys. Josh Giddy in Oklahoma City has been yeah. wonderful to watch. Um, you know, Josh Green will, or Jalen Green, we'll see what happens with him. He obviously mm. has a very high ceiling, and, and nights you watch him play, and you're like, holy cow, this guy's dynamic. Other nights, you're like, eh, he shoots too much. But there's, there's a lot of young talent in this league, but the one thing that the Jays have had that's really unique to very, very few teams is the amount of success they achieved at such a young age. Right. Like you don't see like Evan Mobley and the Cavaliers who are a nice story are probably not going to the Eastern conference finals this year. Okay. John Morant has a real opportunity to do some damage, but the West is very, very top heavy. I'm not it sure. Who's in there. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll see, you know, Zion hasn't played this year at all and we don't even know where he is you know like there's, there's so <laughs> much stuff these two guys have accomplished a lot already and i just feel like and I, and I don't know if this is true and maybe mark this is just maybe me being crazy but it it feels like all the stuff that you read about splitting the jays up comes from a, a, anonymous executives of other teams who probably are like yeah let's see right. we push these guys out because sure. you know having two wing players that are really good uh thriving together wow at such a young age, like that could be a huge problem because there's so little wing depth in the NBA that anybody that's any, like look at Miles Bridges or Mikhail Bridges out in Phoenix, yeah. how important yeah. he is to that team. And oh, he's, yeah. you know, he's not the level of Jason Tatum, but like having a guy like that is huge. Imagine if they had a guy like Jason, like that's my point. You don't trade two young guys just because you can't find a way to make it work right now when they're 23 and 25. That's ridiculous. And, and and by the way, too, and, and Mark, I want you to hit on all that, but like there was somebody put a stat up on Twitter the other day. I wish I could remember who it was, but in the games where Tatum and Brown are both in the lineup and it feels like the numbers should be bigger, but in, in games where they 
over just the last couple of years, not overall all time, but over the last couple of years, since it's been like their team, as we've talked about, the winning percentage is close to 700. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. They, they win yeah. far more often than they lose in the regular sure. season with those two guys available. But <laughs> excuse me, whether it was Tatum, uh, you know, missing a, a lot of time last year with COVID some time this yeah. year, Brown, obviously, <laughs> with the various injuries, including, you know, so much of the end of last year, like there just hasn't been a lot of time where they've shared yeah. the floor. And yet you should. I don't know what the number is, but you should look up their winning percentage in the playoffs when they both play together. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've, yeah, to all this experience you guys are talking about, it's, it's invaluable. Why would you cut that short now? It just doesn't make any sense. Jason Tatum is going to be a top five player in this league. Eventually. Uh, and Jalen is, is going to be top, what, 15, 20? I mean, yeah, he's 10. Maybe He's, ten. The Maybe uh, there. the encouraging stuff. Like I was talking to my buddy the other night about Jalen and why I would not trade this guy. Jalen gets better every year, no question. The twenty two eleven and eleven he had the other night. I mean, and what? It, it, I mean, look, I love Jalen Brown. I think the the staunchest Jalen Brown defenders would never think that he would have eleven assists in a night ever. Right? Never. No. Ever. But, but the thing that drove me crazy about that game were the number of turnovers he had leading up to it. He was mm -hmm. he was averaging like four turnovers a game, five. something like that. I five, okay. It, but he uh, so he turned it around in that game. I mean, if he can control that, I just my biggest question about him is I'm not sure he's really a playmaker. I don't know if you want to run a lot of actions where he has to set up the people up. No, I mean he's look those eleven assist games for Jalen, but like that might never happen again. But right. I, I also don't want to see the games where he has zero assists. You know, no. just go no. out there, oh, no. average, yeah. average yeah. four, and I'm happy. Yeah. Honestly, that's, you yeah. know, I'm not looking for a ton from Jalen Brown yeah. in, in that respect. Uh, less me, more Evan. Let's talk NBA trade deadline, which is approaching. You said you wanted to touch on something with Dennis Schroeder and uh, among others. Mark, you brought it up. Schroeder seemingly is a, a good candidate to go. To me, he has to go. He has to go. Right. I mean, if, if you right. can get something for him, you know, because he's not coming back next year, you're not bringing him back. You know, you like, you got him on a gift of a deal this year. He's certainly, right. he's helped out. He's, you know, he's been better than he's been not, but yeah. in terms of paving the way for the young guys working on building within seeing obviously what Pritchard, you know, has the ability to be, I thought we saw it last year, but it took Ime an extra couple minutes. So seeing, <laughs> you know, Pritchard this year, when he's finally had an opportunity, yeah. use right. your young guys, get, anything yeah. you can get the get the bag of balls that the Schroeder can roll all out onto the floor and and move the guy it just makes sense Evan so here's my thing and I texted this to you Adam earlier this this week and this is sort of my hot take and, and Mark can, can fill in the, the details of what he thinks but like is there like some robust market for Dennis Schroeder that I don't know about because like I, I mean <laughs> who the hell needs Dennis Schroeder right now like I, this is the thing I'm like oh just the Southerners will trade Dennis Schroeder and everything's gonna be fine I'm like yeah, well, you got to find a trade partner for Dennis Schroeder. I understand it's a, it's a small expiring contract and he's a veteran that can come off the bench and give you points, and that's valuable. But, like, we've seen it with Boston this year. It hasn't been always super smooth. So, Mark, my question is, is there actually a trade market for Schroeder or is this just wishful thinking on the behalf of Celtics Nation here? It would have to be a playoff team who needs the scoring. Uh you know, in the backup role. Otherwise, it's his contract. You know, somebody, some GM wants to get out from underneath something. You know, you bring him in and, and he's off the books. I mean. Wasn't there a, a report the other day somebody had linked Schroeder to Minnesota? I could be making that up entirely, but I feel like I saw that. And that's, look, I mean, that's a team that's sitting right now in the play, play in tournament mix. That's a, that's a, yeah. Yeah, that's a team that is that's probably desperate to make the playoffs because they haven't done anything of uh, any worth since KG was there. So, and that's the first KG go around the second. One. You know, they they and Anthony Edwards has really transformed that team and give them a real identity. So, you know, I I would you know maybe it's a team like that that's desperate, like uh, and and this has been Sacramento over the past few years where they're like, oh, we're and this this is oh, the, the inclusion man. of the play in the play in tournament has now allowed for more teams to think that they're hanging around. So when everybody's trying to get Harrison Barnes out of Sacramento last year, they're trying to be buyers and try to find a way to get into the, in the playoffs where everybody with a brain 
It's like there's no way Sacramento's going to the playoffs. And now here we are, they're a complete mess, dumpster fire, and they don't know what to do anymore. But yeah, I, there have been yeah. reports out of Sacramento, De'Aaron Fox, Harrison Barnes, right. Tyrese Halliburton, all these guys that could potentially be on the move. I think, uh, unfortunately, you, you do have, to your point, you have a bunch of teams that are, you know, in that play-in tournament mix, Celtics right. included, obviously, right. that as you sit here right now, a few weeks out from the trade deadline, we don't know whether the hell they're going to be, are they buyers? Are they sellers? Do they do nothing? There are a lot of teams that are in that same boat. Yeah, I think there'll be a buyer for a small piece or a complimentary piece. Uh, the name I've been talking about since last year, who I think would fit perfectly on this team is Terrence Ross. I think he kills yeah. the Celtics every time he plays. It's like it's like the old was it uh, Doc Rivers thing. Anybody that beats him, he just tries to go and get the next season. Right, right. <laughs> Terrence he's, Ross has had so many games against Boston that he kills him. It would make a lot of sense. He's he's just uh, you know you bring him off the bench and tell him to get buckets. That's sort of what they need when they stall from the starting unit. Yeah. Well, it would help the drop off because I mean, this t- I was looking for this tweet earlier and it got deleted, so maybe the, the the data was wrong. But there was a stat flown out there in the Twitter sphere that when Jalen and Jason are on the floor together, they have like a plus five rating this season. Yeah. When they're off the when they're not on the floor together, the the Celtics have like a minus twenty something rating, which is the biggest discrepancy of any duo in the NBA. Uh, you know, on off splits, which I mean, again, if you've been watching the Celtics, this is not shocking to anybody. Getting a nice wing player like Terrence Ross who can score, uh, would obviously help that balance out a little bit because when one of them's on the floor together, you see the defenses and they shift very right. clearly onto one of those two guys, and the right. guys around them can't. I mean, again, I, yeah. I, mean, I love some of the guys on this team, I, I really do. I think there's a lot of you know, I like I like Richardson quite a bit. Um, I pounded the table for shooter in the past, but I've jumped off that train pretty quickly. Uh, but those guys aren't creating offense by themselves. Like Josh Richardson yeah. is not, you know, it's not a guy that's going to create that offense. They need a guy yeah. that can create their own offense and get to the basket. Yeah. And Ross can absolutely yeah. do that. If you, and that's, again, it wouldn't cost you a ton. I don't think, um, you know, he's, I think, in, he, I think he signed for two years. Yeah. But don't know an obvious fit because they need wing scoring and like the, the, you know, it's obviously not coming from Neesmith. It's not coming from Richardson. Um, you know, they, you know, I, I don't know if they have, I mean, Grant is not even really a wing player. He's really kind of more of a small big happens to be, a, you know, on the perimeter, but they don't, and if Grant gets the ball and takes four dribbles, it's never going to end well. So, you know, you need a guy that can, that's comfortable with the ball in his hands can make his own play when things break down because everybody's piling on either Jalen or Jason. And I, that's a great idea, Mark. So guys um, in Philadelphia, uh, well, go ahead, Mark. No, I was going to say uh, Grant's development as a shooter is something that's going to get better too. I mean, if mm-hmm. he, you know, if he's the guy in the corner, when they get, when they corral the two J's, I, I actually think he's played well enough where maybe he, you should think about starting him ahead of the L. Lock him in the corner, cement those sneakers to the to the court in the uh, in those two corners, please. The the more of it, the better. So uh, before we let you go, in Philadelphia tonight, at home against the Bulls tomorrow, I don't think I'm alone in believing the Celtics are going to take one out of the two of those games. So which one's it going to be? Which which one is is going to be the nice surprise game, Mark? I think tomorrow. I think I think the Bulls game. <laughs> I agree. It yeah. makes no sense at all. It's like when they beat Phoenix uh, and blew the doors off them, like in a three o'clock afternoon Sunday game, yeah. whatever it was. It was like, yeah. it was like, yeah, they, you know, they have a chance to get back to five of them. They probably won't because that Phoenix game. Like, I think Adam is like literally quoting at this point that show. You were like, there's no way they get back to 500 because that Phoenix game sitting there. There's no way they're going to win that game. Yeah. As I say this, this means now they're actually going to win that game. Yeah. This Bulls yeah. game has the same exact feel of that, where it's like playing yeah. Philly, then Bulls, you know, starting yeah. to back to back Bulls have been, Probably my favorite storyline all year, to be frankly honest with you. It's a mm-hmm. fun team to watch. Uh, mm-hmm. Would make no sense to beat that team, considering how Boston has played this season. But th- that would absolutely be right on par for the course for this Celtics team for the past couple of years. Well, you, you both left out one key detail as to why it's that Bulls game tomorrow night. It's because it's directly opposite the Patriots game, and nobody's going to be watching. <laughs> so the Celtics are probably going to have their best yeah. game of the year. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> 
All right. Very good. So uh, as, look, we talked about it earlier, the schedule after these two, it, it does get much lighter. So the a a real game. opportunity to, to jump up that Eastern conference. We'll see as long as, you know, like praise be to whoever it is that, that you pray to, that they can stay healthy, at least their key guys. And, and just give it, give us a few weeks, give us two, three weeks of continuity. And I, I think that we'll actually see some good things from this team. Of course, Evan, he is here every week. I'm here as, uh, more often than not. And Mark Murphy, our uh, right. our good pal. Mark, thank you so much. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, guys. Okay. All right, Celtics beat, folks. See you later.